Good evening and welcome. I am Sandra Erickson, a librarian at Stanford Health Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for a community lecture on living better with chronic kidney disease. I'm delighted tonight to introduce Dr. Stafford and Dr. Taiwo. Dr. Taiwo is a kidney transplant nephrologist and a clinical assistant professor of medicine, nephrology at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Stafford is a professor of medicine at the Stanford School of Medicine and the director of the Program on Prevention Outcomes and Practices. In addition, Dr. Stafford is a primary care physician in the Stanford Internal Medicine Clinic, where he focuses on chronic disease prevention and treatment. Chronic kidney disease affects an estimated 37 million people in the US. This talk will focus on lifestyle changes and medical treatments that can have a positive effect on the disease and those living with it. I'm very happy to turn our program over now to Dr. Stafford and Dr. Taiwo. Thank you both for speaking with us tonight. Thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, I, it's really a joy to be here. And I wanted to give the audience members just a little bit of background on this particular session, as well as the series that we've designed around living better with chronic disease. Part of our fundamental belief is that doctors and patients can work together so that patients are able to thrive with chronic disease. And that requires quite a bit. It requires understanding more about the chronic conditions that people live with. It requires understanding some of the medical strategies for dealing with those chronic diseases. And it also requires learning how to talk and have a conversation with physicians about chronic care so that patients really do take a role in managing their own disease. Based on this belief in the better care that can be provided through this shared decision-making between patients and physicians, we've designed this series. And so far in this series, we focused on heart disease, particularly atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, and most recently heart failure. This series has at its core the idea that we need to combine the expertise about a particular chronic disease with strategies that patients can take on themselves to lead to better chronic disease management. In this series, what we've done is featured a prominent specialist in a particular area, and I'm so happy to have Dr. Taiwo with, with us tonight. Um, and then I have served as a primary care doctor. And many of the questions that I have are the sort of questions that my patients ask me about their chronic diseases. Now, tonight we're specifically focusing on chronic kidney disease. This is a really important disease that affects millions of people in the United States and around the world. The good news is that we are learning a lot about how to prevent chronic kidney disease and a lot more about how to manage kidney disease successfully so that it doesn't progress and that people can live uh, better with that particular condition. Um, this is a special disease for me because I have chronic kidney disease. I was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease when I was 25 years old and have been living with chronic disease and chronic kidney disease for the last 35 years. In fact, I've had two kidney transplants and um, am currently doing very well and have no problems uh, to speak of other than some of the side effects from medications that I've taken. So this is a, a particularly interesting topic for me and one that I'm excited to be, uh, be part of presenting to you. I wanna remind you that we're very interested in audience questions. 
And I think the best way to do this is for you to type in through the chat function a particular question. And then I'll be looking at those questions and answering and asking Dr. Taiwo to elaborate further. So this is supposed to be a collaboration between Dr. Taiwo as the specialist, me as the chronic disease patient, as well as primary care doctor, and you, the audience. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Taiwo to give us a brief uh, summary of some of the key facts of, of chronic kidney disease. This is a disease that's quite complex, and yet I think there are ways in which I, we can get across very important information in a really simple way, and that can generate the sort of questions that I'm hoping we have from the audience. So I, I just wanted to, uh, to further introduce Dr. Taiwo as someone that I've known for the last few years at Stanford, and she is really one of the up and coming stars within the Department of Medicine and particularly within the Division of Nephrology. And so without further ado, I'd like Dr. Taiwo to take over and uh, give us that summary about chronic kidney disease. Great, thank you, Randy. Um, so thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. I am so excited to be talking about kidney disease. So I'm gonna be talking about living better with kidney disease. So this is a topic that is of tremendous interest to me and I'm so excited to be here tonight. So for overview, I'm gonna be talking about what the kidney actually does. And then I'm gonna be talking about causes and risk factors for kidney disease. And finally, we'll talk about some prevention and treatments of kidney disease. And so what do the kidneys do? I think in a very broad way, there are two main categories of functions of kidneys. So one, our kidneys help filter blood um, and they also produce hormones. So part of the filtration function is to remove fluids from the blood, so extra fluids, and that comes out as urine. And then we also remove toxins that are building up in our system. And also we balance our electrolytes with our kidneys. So there are a number of minerals and elements in our system, such as our calcium, sodium, potassium levels, and all of these levels are very delicately controlled by kidneys and our body pH is also controlled by the kidneys and as well as our respiratory function. And so together this helps our bodies and our organs to function properly. The kidneys also produce hormones and a lot of people don't recognize this until they have um, kidney failure, but the kidneys actually produce hormones that help us produce red blood cells. They produce hormones that help to regulate blood pressure and they also produce hormones that are very important in our bone health. And so just a brief anatomy lesson. Um, so we, we all, most of us have two kidneys. There are some people who are born with one and some who have a fused kidney, but the majority of people are born with two kidneys. And the kidneys sort of sit in the upper abdomen towards the back and they get their blood supply from a large vessel in our, in our abdomen. And they also drain their blood supply into a large vein in our abdomen. And then they also have these little tubes which are in yellow that are connected to our bladder. And that's where the urine goes from the kidney. And so if you take a cross section of a kidney, um, that's sort of pictured here in the middle, and then to the, to the right of this is a picture of a nephron. So the kidney, as we just mentioned, has a vein, an artery, and a ureter. But inside of the kidneys, you have these filtration units, which are called a nephron. And each kidney has about a million of these filtration units. So if you have two well-functioning kidneys, you have about two million of these filters. And the nephron is composed of a glomerulus as well as tubes. And so what happens is blood goes into the kidney through the renal artery, and then blood goes out of the kidney through the renal vein. And then in between is this uh, sort of filtration and secretion process where the kidney sort of absorbs the things that are important for our body to hold on to, and it sort of secretes things that it needs to get rid of. And then other things that are filtered that are not needed are also excre excreted in the urine. 
And so just to kind of get an idea of how many people are affected by kidney disease, so surprisingly, about one in three Americans have a risk factor for kidney disease. So we'll talk a little bit more later about what certain risk factors are. About 37 million people in the United States are affected by chronic kidney disease and a population of over 300 million, that's pretty striking. And so this is a disease that affects a lot of people. And then about 660,000 people are living with the more advanced stages of kidney failure. So these are stages that require renal replacement therapy, such as dialysis and even transplantation. And we can talk about that later. And so common causes of kidney failure are shown here. The most common cause of kidney failure in the United States is diabetes. So about 38% of people who have kidney failure um, have this as a result of longstanding diabetes. And then hypertension is number two with 25% of people in the US who have kidney disease being diagnosed as having it from hypertension. So if you think about that, diabetes and hypertension actually account for over two thirds of kidney disease in the US. And then there are many other smaller causes of kidney disease, um, but significant such as autoimmune diseases, so these are diseases that cause our own body to sort of attack itself, such as lupus. Infections are also in a very important cause of kidney disease. So people can get just unrelated infections that can cause deposits to build up in the kidneys or directly affect the kidneys. And then medications are also a very um, important cause of some kidney diseases. So, so there are certain types of medications that people need to take for other health conditions, such as chemotherapies for cancer, um, certain pain medications. So there's a class of medications called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as ibuprofen. And this class of drugs, if taken in high quantities for a long time, can slowly cause damage to the kidneys. And also certain types of antibiotics can be toxic to the kidneys. And then finally, another class of um, conditions that can cause kidney disease are classified as congenital, so these are malformations in our kidneys, ureters, and bladders that occur while we're developing in utero. They can later present in life with kidney failure. And so what about risk factors for kidney disease? So I like to think about risk factors in three broad categories. So one is your non-modifiable risk factors. So non-modifiable means that these are things that you really don't have a lot of control over. So these would be things like age, family history, and genetics. We're sort of born in the families with our genes and we can't really change them once we're here. But some people have kidney diseases that actually run in their family and they're inherited, such as polycystic kidney disease. And then some people have a family history of conditions that, are, that put people at risk for kidney disease, such as diabetes and hypertension, like we talked about. And then as you get older, the risk of developing health conditions that might cause kidney disease may also develop. And then when you think about modifiable risk factors, there are a number of different modifiable risk factors, but some of them are obesity. So obesity is a huge health problem in the US, which contributes to disease and a lot of different, to a lot of different diseases. Um, but obesity is something that can be modified by our lifestyle, so our diet and exercise habits. High cholesterol is also a risk factor for kidney disease. And smoking is also a risk factor for kidney disease. So together, in particular, the cholesterol and the smoking can lead to a condition that's called atherosclerosis. So this is basically where cholesterol and other toxic things build up in our arteries and make them hard. And over time, this can actually affect blood flow to our kidneys and cause damage to our kidneys. And then there are other health conditions that um, are also maybe affected by lifestyle, but you know, things that people develop, they can also over time lead to kidney disease. So heart disease, um, some of the same risk factors for that are also implicated in kidney disease. And also as you develop heart failure, if the heart doesn't work very well, that can also affect blood flow and cause kidney disease over time. Liver disease is another condition that can be in a similar fashion cause kidney disease, and then infections such as HIV can cause kidney disease. And 
And so how do you diagnose kidney disease? So there are a number of different ways that kidney disease is diagnosed. So one simple way is to just go into your doctor's office and get a blood test. And there are multiple different blood tests that can be ordered, but generally the first step is to do a blood test called creatinine test. And creatinine is a breakdown of muscle product and it's produced in a steady amount every day. So it, it tends to be a good, not perfect, but a good marker for kidney function. So the kidneys are able to filter creatinine and very little of it gets secreted. And so as your body creatinine goes up, it tells us that there's your kidneys are not filtering it as well. And then there's another term that people who have kidney disease may become familiar with, and it's a glomerular filtration rate. So as I showed in some of the earlier pictures, our kidneys are filled with a bunch of filters, which help get rid of fluid and toxins and balance our electrolytes. And so the glomerular filtration rate kind of gives you an idea of how much of your kidney is functioning. And so a very simple way that I like to present that is if you have two kidneys that are functioning at full capacity, your kidney function is at about 100%. And then there are urine tests that can also be done. So such as the picture that's depicted on the right, um, we can look at your urine to see if you have signs of kidney disease. So if you have, if you're leaking protein in your urine that can be picked up by test. If you're leaking um, blood in your urine that can also be a sign that you're starting to have um, signs of kidney disease. And then we can also do imaging studies such as ultrasounds, CAT scans, MRIs to take a look at your kidneys and get information about um, whether or not you have some structural concerns that might be risk, putting you at risk for kidney disease. And lastly, we can do a kidney biopsy, which is a procedure where we take a tiny piece of your kidney and look under a microscope to decide what exactly is causing your kidney disease. So, if after reviewing your blood test and your urine test and your imaging, your family history, your own personal history, if the cause of your kidney disease is unclear, a biopsy may be needed to, to figure that out. And so when you think about kidney disease, um, kidney disease is, is, is separated in five main stages. And so in the first stage of kidney disease, there is evidence of damage in your kidney and it may not be apparent to the individual, but there might be signs of blood in the urine, not that you can see with your eye, but that can be seen under a microscope. There might be leaking of some protein or there might be some structural abnormalities on some imaging. But at that time, if you do a blood test, your, your GFR, is your filtration rate is still normal and normal is considered like 90 to 100%. And then as you start progressing with kidney disease, your filtration rate goes down. So stage two, it means that you now have a mild reduction, reduction in your kidney filtration at 60 to 89. And then stage three is actually classified into A and B. And so it's a mild to moderate reduction in GFR. Stage four is a more severe reduction in GFR. So your kidney function is about 15 to 30%. And then lastly, stage five is kidney failure. So that's when your GFR or your filtration rate is 15% or less, or you need dialysis. So stage five kidney disease is usually when people start to have symptoms and they usually start to maybe feel fatigue and some of the other symptoms that we can cover in a little bit. So what are signs and symptoms of kidney disease? I think a lot of people wanna know, what, is there something that I should be experiencing right now that would tell me whether or not I have kidney disease? And the truth is in the very early stages, there are generally no symptoms. There might be some signs, but generally these are picked up on, you know, uh, may need to be picked up on routine screening with a, with a physician. But some of the signs that people might see would be foamy urine. So that might indicate that there's a large amount of protein that's getting into the urine. And that may not happen in early stages of kidney failure. Blood in urine, like we talked about. Sometimes when people develop a sudden um, uh, loss of protein in their urine, they may also start to have swelling and you might be able to 
notice that and go to your physician for evaluation. And then high blood pressure may also be a sign. So high blood pressure is both a cause for kidney disease, but it can also be a consequence of kidney disease. And then in the more advanced stages of kidney disease, that's when people start to describe more symptoms. And these symptoms are usually referred to as uremic symptoms. So there is something called a blood urea or nitrogen that builds up in our system once we have advanced kidney failure. And those ure uremic symptoms include things like just fatigue, sort of just feeling tired and unwell, nausea, appetite can become really poor and sometimes people have weight loss. Sometimes food just tastes really bad. A few people will describe sort of a metallic taste when they eat their food. You can have itching from the buildup of certain um, toxins in our body. You can then have fluid overload. So as you stop making as much urine or as your urine output goes down, you can start to have swelling and you, those fluids can also build up in the lungs and cause shortness of breath. And then sometimes people can have confusion and it may not be really apparent to the person or they might notice that their thinking is not quite as clear, but oftentimes family members are sort of noticing that their family member isn't quite behaving like their usual self. And so how do you treat kidney disease? So kidney disease, because it's caused by many different things, the primary thing that we need to do is figure out what's causing it and treat the underlying conditions. So if it's hypertension, if it's diabetes, it's important for us to get those conditions under very good control. And then another option we have is to use medications. So once people develop kidney disease, there are some, there's one particular class of medication um, in certain types of kidney diseases that can slow down the progression. And then no matter what causes your kidney disease, if you have high blood pressure, that can make your kidney failure worse or it can make it progress faster to a state of failure. So regardless of what your kidney disease is from, it's very important to have optimal blood pressure control. And then in the final or more advanced stages of kidney disease, there's the option for dialysis, which I'll talk about in a little bit, as well as kidney transplantation. So what is dialysis? So dialysis is actually pretty complicated, but there are two different types, main types of dialysis. So the first type of dialysis is called hemodialysis. So that's essentially blood dialysis. And what happens with hemodialysis is the individual who needs this type of therapy has some sort of access, um, either a catheter or a fistula to take blood out of their body. So blood goes out and then they take it and put it through a filter. And then that filter basically cleans the blood and takes out extra fluids and toxins. And then eventually the blood is returned back into the individual. And so dialysis is usually a treatment that people need to do three times a week for about three hours. But some people actually do dialysis at home and some people actually, because they can do it at home, may do it every day. The other option for dialysis is called peritoneal dialysis. And this, dial um, this type of dialysis takes advantage of our own body. So it uses our abdominal cavity as um, a filtration barrier. And essentially the way it works is we have fluid that goes into the abdomen and all the toxins and high electrolytes sort of move into that fluid. And then you have another uh, mechanism to drain that fluid out of your abdomen. And peritoneal dialysis is usually performed every day at home. Now, the other option for um, kidney uh, treatment is kidney transplantation. So once you're, once you're at an advanced stage of kidney failure um, or on dialysis, you can be listed for a kidney transplant. And kidney transplant is, an, is a great treatment choice because it does improve the quality of life and the quantity of life compared to dialysis. And there are also two main kinds of kidney transplant. So you can get a kidney transplant from a living donor, so a family member or friend, or you can get one from a deceased donor. So there are some advantages to having a living donor. So one advantage is if you have a donor that's medically suitable and ready to donate, and you, if 
as a recipient are also medically ready for, for transplant, the wait time to get a transplant is pretty short. It's really just a function of how long it would take to be evaluated. And then living donor kidneys typically last an average of 15 to 16 years. So there are individuals who have living donor transplants that far exceed the expected lifespan of a living donor transplant, but there are also individuals who don't quite meet that average lifespan for a variety of reasons. And then living donor kidneys generally will work right away. So if an individual is on dialysis at the time of getting this transplant, they will usually not require dialysis any longer as soon as they have their surgery. Now with deceased donor, there's a very long wait time in certain parts of the country, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, the typical lifespan is a little bit less than um, a living donor kidney, so it's an average of 10 to 12 years. But that being said, there are people who are living with a deceased donor kidney and are more than 20 years out from their transplant date and they're still doing well, so there's still a pretty good range. And one thing to note about deceased donor kidneys is they don't always work immediately, so about 30 to 40 percent of the time when you put them in, they're still a little sleepy, maybe because they've been on ice for a very long time, but they do eventually work. But individuals who receive this type of transplant may still need dialysis for a few days or a few weeks before it works. Now, what? so, so we talked about the benefits of kidney transplantation, which is really improving your quality of life. I think dialysis is a great option when there is no transplant option. Um, but kidney transplant is really the preferred treatment. But in the long term, there are certain risks that are associated with kidney transplant, and they're mostly related to the immunosuppression. That is the medications that you have to take for, to help keep your kidney going. And some of those side effects are listed here, infection, cancer, diabetes, heart disease. And so generally, once an individual receives a kidney transplant, they're monitored very closely by their transplant center. And there are many things that you can do to try to help mitigate your risk for developing any of these conditions, and inc um, including primary prevention of certain things and um, getting your cancer screening done pretty early and getting your blood test done when you need to. So things can either be caught early or prevented. And so um, there are a number of people who are waiting for a kidney transplant. So unfortunately, it would be nice if everyone could get a kidney transplant as soon as they need it. I looked up the wait list for kidney transplants um, on the United Network of Organ Sharing today, and there are over 91,000 people as of this afternoon in the United States who are waiting on the list for a kidney transplant. And so far this year, so between January and September, there have been about 24,000 people who have received a deceased donor transplant, and there have been about 44,000 people who've gotten living donor transplants. So as you can see, there's a huge gap between the number of people who we've transplanted this year compared to the people who are waiting, and people are added to that wait list every day. And so essentially everyone else is waiting on dialysis until they're able to get a transplant, and there are also things that you can do as your way to keep yourself healthy and suitable to get a kidney transplant. And so I guess in sort of wrapping up, there are things that people can do to prevent kidney disease. So I think one of the more important things that you can do is have a healthy lifestyle. So a healthy lifestyle would, be, would involve following a good diet, a good balanced diet, um, and exercising regularly, avoiding dehydration. We haven't really talked about water during this talk, but there's sort of an optimal amount of water to consume every day. You never wanna be excessive, but you also don't wanna not drink sufficiently. Maintaining a healthy and normal weight is also important. And then routine follow-up with your primary care doctor, because there often aren't any symptoms of kidney disease until it's really advanced, it's really important that you follow up with your primary care physicians to um, diagnose and detect conditions early or to help identify risk factors and help manage those at an early stage before they become um, health complications. And so to summarize, I can't emphasize enough 
the need for primary prevention. Um, again, this is lifestyle and seeing your primary doctor. And then once you're in those uh, stages, early stages of kidney disease, stage one through stage four, at this point, you may need medication. So whatever is needed to kind of help remember to take your medications, follow up with your doctor, and also continuing with the lifestyle changes, which can kind of slow progression. And last but not least is if you're in the more advanced stage of kidney disease, I think we're lucky in the field of, of nephrology of kidney to have treatment strategies that can keep people alive. So hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and transplantation are fantastic treatment options, not perfect, but they sort of help people live a good quality of life and, and uh, you know, be there for their family. So I think with that, I'm gonna wrap, I will end my presentation and we will open it up for questions. Thank you so much. And I really appreciated the brief uh, summary. Uh, you talk quite a bit about blood pressure and we already have a question in the chat about high blood pressure. And I had a couple of, uh, of questions around this. So why is it that kidney disease and high blood pressure are so closely related? And then uh, a kind of follow-up question is, ideally from the viewpoint of preventing or managing kidney disease, what's the ideal blood pressure? Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really great question. I think a lot of what we do um, in management of kidney disease is actually taking care of hypertension, which is high blood pressure. And so there is the link to kidney disease because, you know, as you, as we showed in the presentation, the kidneys are made up of a lot of little tubules and glomeruli. And so you have blood vessels that are going through your entire kidney. It's essentially a big network of vessels. And so when the pressure going through your blood pressure is really high, over time, that can sort of slowly injure and damage your kidney vessels and tubules, and you can just develop slow scarring over time. And so when we, when we do biopsies, we can actually see these changes in the kidney that are caused by high blood pressure. So there's, there's that really, really um, tight link between high blood pressure and causing kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And then I think also, um, you know, blood pressure medication and the management of that is pretty important. So a lot of people want to know, well, what is the blood pressure that I should go for? And I think overall, the number that are, there are two components of your blood pressure. So the top number is a systolic blood pressure and the bottom number is a diastolic blood pressure. And some of the national societies have sort of redefined what those targets should be for hypertension in the last couple of years. But overall, I think aiming for a top blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of 120 or so or less is sort of the target. And a diastolic blood pressure of about 80 or less is, a, is generally a good blood pressure to maintain mm -hmm. for kidney disease and other health conditions. And I know from some of my own research that if we just look at blood pressure in the population in the United States, we actually are quite a bit away from that goal of 120 over 80. And uh, obviously what that implies is that people are at higher risk of kidney disease because of their blood pressure. And that that's a, that's a ubiquitous problem in this country and something that you know, I think a lot of us feel we should be doing better at, at managing. Yes, I would agree with that. I mean, I think the prevalence of hypertension in the US population is actually quite high. So that really does put a number of Americans at risk for kidney disease. And I think that statistic of one out of three Americans having some sort of risk factor um, is alarming, but it sort of makes sense given how prevalent hypertension is in our population and other chronic health conditions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, I have a, another question, which essentially is for people who are developing chronic uh, kidney disease at, let's say, a, a stage three or worse. Are there any special precautions that they should take to avoid further damage to their kidneys? 
Yeah, so that's another great question. So usually once people are in that stage three or stage three B chronic kidney disease, at that time, it's great to continue working with a primary care provider and also with a nephrologist. So a nephrologist is an individual who specializes in kidney disease. So at some point in the stage three disease, it's good to, to be referred to a nephrologist so that you can get education mm -hmm. about things that you can do. But I think, you know, at that point, hopefully your kidney disease has been diagnosed and you know what's causing your kidney disease. So it's really important to treat whatever the conditions are that are leading to the kidney disease. So if it's diabetes, if it's hypertension, if it's a certain medication that you're taking that has been identified as possibly contributing, stopping those medications, if it's related to infections or urinary infections, there are also medications or prophylactic things that can be done to help prevent um, the recurrence of infections. And so I think a big thing is really figuring out what the underlying cause is and treating those underlying causes. Some people have kidney diseases that are from autoimmune diseases and they might benefit from immunosuppression to help treat those conditions. And then outside of that, um, I think the blood pressure is one, a theme that keeps coming up because as I mentioned, no matter what causes your kidney disease, if you have kidney disease from lupus or from diabetes, if your blood pressure is high, that doesn't really, that's going to make things worse. So it could actually make your kidney disease progress faster than it would otherwise. So maintaining that great blood pressure is important. And medication is one piece of that, but lifestyle is another very important piece of that. So, you know, people would have to look into monitoring their dietary salt intake. Um, exercise has been shown to be beneficial for blood pressure having a normal healthy weight or you know, if you're overweight, some weight loss can also go a really long way to improving your blood pressure control. And all those things actually improve health conditions that are also associated with kidney disease. So it all sort of overlaps, but all of it together helps to improve, um, can help to slow down the progression. But there are some medications in particular, one blood pressure medication that's been studied for a particular type of kidney disease that may be prescribed to help slow down the progression of kidney disease as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one additional factor that the uh, questioner uh, noted was also needing to avoid contrast for some mm. ray or CT procedure, which, you know, sometimes I, I know in my own experience, the radiologists are extremely careful about making sure that uh, that they're careful around that sort of process. But that kind of fits into this category of, of medications to be very careful with. Uh, and yes. so the non-steroidal medications like ibuprofen or uh, naproxen, Aleve and, uh, and ibuprofen or uh, Motrin. Now those are the things that get the most people into trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's actually a really great point about the contrast. I think we get a lot of questions about people who have mild to moderate or even severe forms of kidney disease, whether or not they can have a CT contrast to, uh, to diagnose a different condition. And so, you know, those are very, you know, have to be approached delicately. I think a lot of times if the study is absolutely needed for diagnosis and treatment and it actually will change what your doctor does, um, we can try some strategies such as making sure you're hydrated to sort of mitigate the risk mm -hmm. It's not 100%. I mean, we could try these strategies and they may not always work. But if you needed those types of studies, you know, I think you're you, in conjunction with your physicians and the radiologists, they can sort of figure out the best way to move forward with that. And if there are alternate studies that can be performed. Another question has come up, which is just thinking about how new technologies might increase the range of strategies we have for end stage. Uh, kidney disease, that is people who now are uh, either going to go on dialysis or be recommended for transplantation. Uh, one question is about artificial kidneys. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the different pathways that scientists are trying to follow to try to come up with something that could replace dialysis and pretty much get rid of the need for transplantation. And how close are we with those sort of technologies? 
That's another fantastic question. So I, I get that, uh, that question a few times as well in my clinics. And so <laughs> I will say that the kidneys are so intricate, so elegant. I don't think I, you know, I just very briefly touched on all the aspects of the kidney. And it's very difficult to duplicate what that what our body does naturally, right? So there are a number of different groups that are working on an artificial kidney. I think ideally people think of creating a kidney that's even implantable. So it's small enough to put in our bodies or to attach to our bodies, such as like an insulin pump and sort of do that filtration function. And there, there have been groups that have worked on different artificial kidneys. There's nothing that's ready for prime time at this point. I think it's just really difficult to, I said there are 2 million filters in our kidney. There's a million in each kidney, right? So developing mm -hmm. something that is small enough that can sort of replicate what our body does naturally is challenging, but I'm so thankful that there are engineers and then by design people who are thinking about this question and are sort of developing and problem solving and coming up with ways to, to, to develop something that would be um, more convenient and, and maybe a portable sort of artificial device that people can use while they're waiting for, for a transplant patient. Um, mm -hmm. So there's nothing that's ready for prime time. I, if I were to guess, who knows, maybe in the next decade there will be something, but that mm -hmm. nothing that's ready to go right now. Um, and so I think we, we really have our dialysis, which is a big clunky machine, but it, it mm -hmm. does the job right now. And there's the different options that people have to help hopefully match their lifestyle. I think a lot of people opt for the home therapies um, just to have more convenience um, with their families, if they have jobs or things like that. So yeah. I find it particularly interesting that you know both transplantation and dialysis really came onto the scene, you know, approximately uh, 70 years ago. And uh, in some ways, they have remained the mainstay of treating end-stage kidney disease. There have been some improvements, particularly in the drugs for transplantation. Uh, mm -hmm. There are kind of more sophisticated ways of doing dialysis. But in a large kind of very broad sense, um, there haven't really been that many changes in either of those technologies over that 60 to 70 year period. And it's interesting that, you know, it seems like there are areas where there have been more medical innovation. I think kidney disease is sort of due for another breakthrough perhaps. Amen, I would totally agree with that. I think we are overdue for the next best innovation in management of end stage renal disease. And Actually, uh, we have a few biodesign fellows at Stanford who are interested in solving problems in nephrology. So I mm -hmm. hope that something will actually come out of that um, through their work. So, so we'll see. Great. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting work, but you know, uh, as far as I know, we're still quite a ways away from making a product that you know could meet the the high need that's out there for renal replacement therapy. Correct. Agreed. Now, you know, one topic that, of course, is on everybody's mind is COVID and mm, uh -huh. coronavirus. Can you talk a little bit about whether people with kidney disease are more at risk of getting infection? And I'm particularly interested in this question about people on who have had transplants, because obviously it's a chronic disease and in some sense is should increase the risk of severe COVID. But there's also this issue of some of the immunosuppressive drugs, those drugs that dampen down the effect of the immune system may actually be protective. And in fact, one such drug called dexamethasone, a corticosteroid or steroid medicine is actually used in the treatment of severe COVID. So can you give us a rundown on you know, are people with kidney disease at higher risk? And what about people on drugs for transplants? All right, so I will tackle the first question. Are people with kidney disease at higher risk for, for COVID-19? So I guess the first thing is, if you are exposed to COVID-19, will you have severe disease from that? Because as we know with the disease, 
a lot of people, the majority of people are actually asymptomatic and then a small proportion of those have symptoms and out of those, some need to be managed in the hospital setting or even in an ICU setting. Mm -hmm. So when you think about kidney disease, um, as we've talked about, the disease COVID-19 seems to more severely affect older people and people with comorbid conditions. So comorbid conditions are conditions like diabetes, hypertension. And so as we talked about, people with kidney disease very frequently have these conditions. So they very frequently have hypertension and diabetes. And so the statistics say that if you have these conditions, you're at higher risk for developing a more severe complication if you were to get COVID-19. And so I think that yes, the answer is if you have kidney disease, you are at higher risk. But overall, I think anything that one can do to follow all the recommendations and the guidelines, the social distancing, wearing masks when you're in public space, um, spaces, washing hands, whatever you can do to kind of do your part to stay safe and reduce your risk of being exposed to the disease, prevention is always better than cure. So I think the first thing would be to try to avoid getting ill with COVID-19. Now, when you think about transplantation, I think that that's a very interesting question because in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of concern about transplant recipients. And we were getting a ton of questions from our patients who have been transplanted about whether or not they were at higher risk of getting very, very ill with disease. And at that time, you know, there was little data. And so we presumed that because transplant recipients are at higher risk for most other infections, well, then COVID would be, the coronavirus wouldn't be any different and cause more severe disease. But what we've actually seen is that um, transplant patients have gotten COVID-19 and many have actually recovered. And so um, the last time I looked at that, I think the uh, mortality rate was just a little bit higher than general population. Um, but that, you know, there is definitely a risk of more severe illness. Um, as you mentioned, there are like two aspects of the disease. One, the fact that you're immunosuppressed puts you at higher risk for getting infections. But then we've also seen that people on immun immunosuppression, there might be some mitigation of that infl inflammatory um, storm that has been described as causing more severe disease. And so transplant patients are at risk for getting COVID-19. They are at risk for more severe disease, but what we're seeing is that it's, it, it's only slightly higher than the general population, which I think is very fortunate. And so I think time will tell, we're getting more data. There are now registries that are following transplant recipients. And so we're getting more data all the time about that question. So it sounds like in large part, what you're saying is there is some background risk there. Some of it has to do with the sort of things that actually cause kidney disease in the first place, but that you know, kind of across the board, probably the most important thing is to take those precautions to keep from getting infected in the first place. Things like That's right. wearing masks when social distancing isn't possible and just uh, being care about taking care with the, the sort of interactions we have with other people and uh, trying to, to make sure that those we interact with don't have any symptoms. Although that mm -hmm. is only partially effective with so mm -hmm. many having asymptomatic COVID. Right. Right. That's right. Um, one of the other questions, this is uh, getting a little more uh, into the details of medications that could be used for kidney disease. There's a particular diabetes drug. Um, and in, in this family, um, one called Depagliflozin. And this drug is turning out to be very interesting because not only does it have this benefit in diabetes, but that benefit seems to apply to other diseases such as kidney disease and heart failure. Can you talk a little bit about this class of medications and, and where you think this, they're gonna fit in how we manage kidney disease, let's say in the next five years or so? Yeah, no, that's another really great question. I think this uh, drug, which is the SGL2 class of diabetes medications has been the, the star, I think, of the last uh, year or two now. So it's, I think 
as you mentioned, this medication actually has been shown to have a lot of benefit for people with heart disease. Obviously, it's, it's beneficial in the treatment of diabetes and uh, also for people who have kidney disease and certain forms of kidney disease, it's been shown to be beneficial. So I think increasingly there was a different class of, medi a di a class of blood pressure medication called an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker that's been classically used for people with um, kidney diseases that lose protein or kidney diseases that are associated with diabetes. And these medications have actually been shown to slow down the progression. And I think the data is now showing that there is, in, there is also that same sort of effect when you use this new diabetes medication in, in people with kidney disease. So there's even thought about using it in people who don't have diabetes, but just to use it for the benefit that it could have in slowing down the progression of kidney disease. So it's an interesting new medication um, we, I take, a, I take care primarily of transplant recipients, and we're now starting to think about using these class of medications in that transplant space as well to help sort of preserve and prolong kidney function when people start showing signs of kidney injury in their transplant organ. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we haven't had outside of these class of blood pressure medications, we really haven't had any medications that have come out in recent years that, that, that can be used for this type of in indication. And so I think it's something very exciting, another tool medication-wise that we have at our disposal to help in the management of kidney disease as well. The time will tell, but I think it's, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. hey, is there any reason to think that the effect of the SGLT inhibitors would, um, would not be additive with ACE inhibitors, that is, can we, can we figure that we can get double the benefit if we use both types of medications? Yeah, so I think that's also another interesting question that um, combined whether or not they would provide more benefit. I think the way I approach it is if there's a good indication to have you on an ACE inhibitor for blood pressure control, and you're also an individual who has diabetes that could benefit from this medication, that you could actually have a little bit more benefit in the progression um, I don't know that there is data that shows if combined they are more effective together, but I think that's something that I can look up. There might be some more literature that's emerging on that, but I think there's no reason to not use them in conjunction if there are indications for both of those medications. And overall, the both of them together um, sort of work to slow down progression of kidney disease. Yeah, great. You know, I wondered if we could spend the last few minutes just kind of focusing on those things that people with kidney disease can do to really help themselves manage the disease. And, uh, you know, I know that you, you mentioned several times physical activity and, uh, you know, taking care of yourself, even kind of this idea of stress reduction. Um, also diet is a a big area of, um, you know, where people really can make a difference. Can you talk a little bit about what you consider a, a kidney healthy diet? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question because that varies depending on what stage of kidney disease you're in. Mm -hmm. So I think in the earlier stages of kidney disease, the same things that are considered healthy for the average general population are also considered healthy for a, a, an individual who has kidney disease. Mm -hmm. So overall, this is a diet that's rich in, in, in fruits if you're not diabetic, because that have, fruits have sugar, vegetables, mm -hmm. um, whole grains, less processed foods and added fats and less simple sugars, and then proteins and healthy sources of protein. So lean meats such as chicken and white meats and fish, and those are sort of the main elements of a basic a healthy diet. So, you know, at the early stages of kidney disease, that's sort of acceptable for everyone to mm -hmm. be on a diet like that. And then the other component is also watching dietary salt intake and minimizing processed foods because the processed foods and that's foods that you sort of buy that are already pre-made, even though you don't add any salt, they sort of already have salt in them. So sort of monitoring and watching that as well, because that can contribute to um, blood pressure concerns. Yeah. And then when and people- so what, you're, what you're kind of saying is essentially that's a, you know, a heart healthy diet. And mm -hmm. that's sort of 
dietary focus on the vegetables, fruits for most people, whole grains, cutting down the sugars, cutting down the, the processed starches. Those are good for lots of things, including prevention of kidney disease. Absolutely. And, but that changes a bit, I take it, as, uh, as kidney disease gets worse. So what, what sort of, how do you have to modify things as kidney disease well, progresses? Yeah, we can talk about the more extreme case. So once people are on, say, dialysis, for example, you know, and that's when your, your own kidney function isn't as good and you're getting a treatment every other day, at that point, people really need to be careful about uh, foods that contain certain types of electrolytes. So you'll hear a lot about potassium intake if you're an individual who has end-stage renal disease or even advanced stages of kidney disease at stage four. And so people have to be really careful about foods. And, you know, you know, a lot of people are tech savvy and can get on Google and Google high potassium foods and sort of pull up a list of everything that has potassium, such as, you know, oranges, bananas, avocados, tomatoes, potatoes, that kind of stuff. And then people also really need to be careful about phosphorus intake. So we didn't spend a lot of time talking about mineral bone disease and metabolism, but, you know, dietary sources of phosphorus, you'd be surprised at how much foods contain phosphorus, and a lot of processed foods have them. Um, so people really would have to learn to look at labels of things that they're consuming to kind of know what to avoid. And for, for individuals who are on dialysis, there's usually a dietitian or a nutritionist at the dialysis center. They can also provide a lot of information about diet and what sort of foods to avoid. And some people are able to eat a little bit more of those foods if they still have some amount of kidney function left. And other people really have to do work harder to sort of eliminate or really reduce their intake of certain types of foods. And we haven't talked a lot about fluids, but fluids also might need to be modified at more mm -hmm. advanced stages of kidney disease. Yeah, great. So I, I think the overall message is a lot of the things that people should be doing anyway are good for the kidneys. So I, I have a, you know, a, a, a question of personal relevance as a primary care doctor. I'm wondering if you could, uh, you could tell me what is the, what are the kind of one or two things that you really wish primary care doctors knew about kidney disease that uh, would help patients, you know, better take care of themselves and, and have, uh, and live better with kidney disease. Yeah, so I think um, it's really great being able to work with primary care providers because they do a lot of the early grunt work when it comes to education and taking care of individuals who have kidney disease, and that's really fantastic. So I think one of the things that uh, is helpful, I think, is early referral. So in the early stages of kidney disease, it's very appropriate to have that managed by primary care doctor. But once you start having more advanced stages of kidney disease, such as that stage 3B and higher, it's good to be referred to a nephrologist because you know you don't want to get to know your nephrologist for the first time when you need dialysis. It does take some planning. And so having a relationship with your nephrologist um, and then learning, having more educational resources available at that time and basically mm -hmm. learning what you can do to slow things down or even how to prepare for dialysis and how that might affect your life and learning mm -hmm. about the different dialysis modalities. It's not infrequent that people kind of show up with the very end stage of kidney and, and they're being started on dialysis immediately and that can be pretty traumatic. Um, and then I think the other thing is, um, you know, educating people about transplantation as an option that again is probably is better done in a nephrology or transplant nephrology setting. We're really looking for our transplant nephrologists, I mean, our general nephrologists to refer people once they're at that stage four or five mm -hmm. uh, kidney disease for, for transplant so that they can be listed early because the waiting time for kidneys can be several years. The sooner you can get on the wait list, the better in terms of accumulating time that counts towards your, your transplant. Thanks so much for the detailed answer. So I, uh, we are at the top of the hour at eight o'clock, at least uh, Pacific Daylight Time. And this has been great having this conversation with you, uh, Dr. Taiwo. And I think that what you've emphasized is that there are some things that 
people can do to really better manage their kidney disease, kind of at all stages, even in the mode of trying to prevent the occurrence of kidney disease in the first place, all the way to those people with more severe kidney disease who are getting ready for a dialysis or transplantation. So I think this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate the questions that have come in from the audience members. Didn't necessarily get to answer all of them, but uh, we had some great questions and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to continuing this, uh, this conversation with you about kind of innovations in kidney disease care. And uh, also looking forward to future sessions that deal with living better with other chronic diseases. But I think chronic kidney disease is such an important uh, disease and so prevalent and its risk factors are so prevalent that it's something that I feel everyone in the population needs to know about and needs to start thinking about these issues, even if it's from the viewpoint of how to prevent kidney disease. So I wanna thank you for your, uh, your time and your expertise. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me again. This was a pleasure and it was really fun for me as well. So Great. look forward to the next time. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to thank both of you for the information you shared tonight. It has been so informative, relevant, important. Um, as a guidepost to all of us as to how to live our life and especially for kidney patients. So thank you very much and good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight.